Chapter Three of The Directory of a Devout Life by F. B. Meyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Three, The Active Side of the Blessed Life. Matthew Chapter Five, Verses One to Twelve. Let us now turn to the active side of the blessed life. The merciful are not content with bearing wrong. They pity the wrongdoer, pity him with a great compassion, because they realize that the heart which inflicts wrong must itself be tortured by remorse, scourged with the whips of the furies, and certain to have an even more terrible awakening to shame and everlasting contempt. The merciful, therefore, go forth with a great longing to deliver the evildoer from himself. It was thus that the master felt when he bore the sins of his murderers in his own body on the tree, prayed for their forgiveness, and from his throne of glory sent the Spirit to turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. The eyes of mercy are deep with compassionate glances, full of tears, the homes of prayer, the feet of mercy are soft in their tread, for they will not break the bruised reed, nor quench the smouldering spark in the dimly burning flax. The voice of mercy is generous to the fallen, gentle to the weak, and gracious to the offender. From the heart of mercy, soothing balm flows to the wounds of sinners, of sufferers, and of the world. The only way in which thou canst become merciful is to remember how much mercy thou needest and hast obtained. Seeing, said the Apostle, that we have obtained mercy, we faint not. Ah, think of the ten thousand talents that have been forgiven thee, and thou wilt not take thy brother by the throat and demand the hundred pence in which he is a defaulter. Hast thou forgotten the moment when thou heardest the Lord say, thy sins, which were many, are all forgiven thee? And art thou going to resent the approach of a sinful soul, which loathes the miserable past, and longs to be emancipated from the burden of unforgiven sin? Remember thine own exceeding bitter cry which God has recorded in his book. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. The divinely merciful become, in the very nature of things, the pure in heart. They have come to estimate by their own inner experiences, and by the long effort which the inveterate sin of others has demanded, how terrible and horrible a thing sin is. The mother who has nursed one of her children through some loathsome and painful disease is filled with horror at it and will take extravagant precautions to ward off the least germ or microbe that menaces her home. Only those who have been forgiven again and again, and who have forgiven, are quick to discern the first symptom of impurity, and to turn from it with shuddering horror. Yes, and to know what sin costs to those that have to deliver the sinner is such a revelation of the bitter suffering of the Redeemer that, in view of what impurity costs him, the soul flees from every tint of uncleanness, lest it should add one pang more to that heart which is already pierced through with many sorrows. The way to purity is by love. Wouldst thou be pure? Love Christ best of all, and love sinful men with a great pity, and love shall be in thee like a fire. It is said that, when Adam and Eve were created and lived in Eden, they needed no garment of any kind, because their native innocence emitted rays of light which enswathed their persons as an atmosphere. As much may be said of love, for where it fills the heart it sheds forth light and fire, which proceeds from the very centre of our being, as the fire of God in the midst of the burning bush. The pure in heart are naturally the peacemakers, because they cannot rest satisfied that the world of men should remain alienated from the life and holiness of God. They become, therefore, messengers of peace and benediction, seeking to reconcile between God and man, or between man and man, which is a most needful work, if ever the wrongs of time are to be righted, and the earth become the home of love. 
the way to this is to ask god to tell thee what work he is doing in the world and whether thou mayest be permitted to help him he will tell thee that having laid the foundations of peace in the cross he is going on to reconcile all things to himself whether they be in heaven or on earth or under the earth and if thou wouldst have fellowship with him thou must set thyself to deal with all that breaks peace in thyself and in others often in their prayers god's servants ask him to help them without doubt the phrase can be abundantly justified but does it not suggest that god is to shape his activities to the mould of our schemes and accompany us along our chosen path is it not better to realize that all the burden and responsibility rest upon him who is mighty and that all working whether to will or do must emanate from him as the fountain and pass through us as the channel submerging us as it passes forth to its blessed and victorious end preeminently god is entitled the god of peace he is ever engaged in healing the wounds and reconciling the enmities of the world as nature covers the battlefield with golden harvests so does god seek to undo the results of feud and strife and lay foundations of justice for the temple of peace blessed indeed are they whom he associates with himself in such pacific ministries but all such become persecuted and hated it cannot be otherwise apparently in such a world as this to have fellowship with the lamb we must have fellowship in his rejection and suffering the servant is not above his lord and therefore the master said sadly ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that i am baptized with it is impossible to follow the lord closely and not be bespattered by the mud that was cast at him indeed to miss it may fill us with questionings the soldier who follows the colonel through the thick of the fight will almost certainly have some scar to carry to his after years we must see to it that all the evil is set against us falsely and that we are reproached for the name of christ is this thine experience be of good cheer thou art on the track bedewed by the tears and blood of the martyrs of jesus and as they overcame so shalt thou be thou faithful unto death and he shall give thee a crown of life but through all thou shalt have a secret joy a secret supply of strength and a sweet intimacy with him who before pontius pilate witnessed the good confession it should be noticed that these beatitudes run in a parallel line with first corinthians chapter thirteen and show what love can be and do poverty in spirit is love in her chosen garb of humility for she vaunteth not herself and is not puffed up meekness is love in the presence of wrong mourning is love in tears hunger is love's appetite mercy is love on her errands of beneficence purity is love on fire peacemaking is love's effort to adjust the wrong of the world persecution is love's requital at the hands of those whom she would help and love is all this intensely perennially constantly because she cannot help it character has been defined as being what a man is in the dark and love is all this not for fee or reward not for notoriety or advertisement but because she cannot be other to be this is to be herself but who is sufficient for these things how can they be originated and perpetuated what is their nutriment and support there is but one reply the holy spirit must come upon thee and overshadow thee christ must be formed in thee heaven must descend to thee before it can shine out from thee it is affirmed that the evangelical side of religion is lacking in the sermon on the mount but surely it is implied the broad much trodden road foretells the great city whither it leads and these wonderful chapters inevitably conduct to calvary and the upper room let a man seek to attain to christ's ideal and he will discover the infinite disparity between its crystal heights 
and his ineffectual efforts to clamber to their majestic crest. He will need the propitiation and cleansing of the blood of the cross. He will confess to the weakness and impotence of the flesh. He will lie at the feet of the crucified as one dead, until the life of his resurrection enters to infill, indwell, and empower. There is no hope of our being able to realize this exquisite portraiture by imitation or even by meditation. No. He who originally conceived this ideal, who himself lived it, must incarnate himself within us by the Holy Spirit, that he may reproduce in and through us that which he inspired us to desire. He must give us what he commands. He must be in us what he prescribes. End of chapter 3